Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Success Insight podcast. Our guest today is Idi Uyo. Idi is an Olympic scholar and sports marketing specialist. After 12 plus years of delivering value for corporate clients at IBM, ID decided to pursue his passion for sports, primarily in the areas of marketing, events, and content creation. ID provides strategic consulting services for global brands, international sports federations, Olympic committees, municipalities, and college bodies. ID, welcome to the Success Insight Podcast. Thank you so much, Howard. It's great to be here. Happy New Year to you. And a very happy New Year to you. Wishing you a prosperous and healthy New Year. And if it's anything like seeing some of your work in 2019, and especially since the Olympics are coming up this year, I have no doubt you are going to be one busy man this year. I hope so. I mean, at least that's the plan. And we're working towards that. Fantastic. All right. You and I have known each other for a couple of years now. And one of the things that I admire most about you is just your your passion for sports and passion for history. Can you share a little bit about with our audience how you came to really hone in on this this really wonderful niche that that really extends out on a global scale, which is sports marketing and sports history, especially around these global sporting events? Thank you, Howard. Yes. Growing up, my parents, who were both teachers at the university level, they always used sports as a teaching tool. They found that sports had all these inherent lessons built into the elements of sports, whether it's competition, fair play, disappointment, unfair play, and what have you. As a kid, we watched the Olympics several years ago, and I'm dating myself here with the old black and white TV with the rabbit ear antennas and things like this. We have that too, by and the way. <laughs> I'm good. It just wasn't my house. All right. So with that, then, I remember my mom's distinctly, it was one of the Olympic Games in which Queen Elizabeth II was kicking off the Games, and we had never really seen what a queen looked like in person. You always read about in fairy tales and all this. And so she used that opportunity to tell us about the Commonwealth and what that is. And we learned about apartheid because that was part of the elements of the 1976 Olympic Games. I fully date myself here, Howard. They've always used sports as a teaching tool. And global events seem to be where the focus was, whether or not it was the Olympics, the World Cup, boxing. And my dad was a huge, huge, huge sports fan. That's really how it started. And so they they always emphasize taking the lessons out of sports. So as I've grown up throughout my career, I've always touched the tentacles of sports, even at IBM, working on the Olympic assignment at IBM at three Olympic Games in 96, 98, and 2000. So it's always been a part of my professional career one way or the other. So about five and a half years ago, I decided that I wanted to turn it into a full-time career and leverage the skills I had learned in corporate at IBM from sales and marketing to developing what I knew in the industry. And that's really how it started. And that's the genesis of where I am today. So, Heidi, when you talk about sports and especially world-class sports, it's like the Olympics, the, the World Cup, compared to local sports. And we did a podcast earlier in 2019. Gentleman was a, a, a sports statistician, wrote a book on all the stats and football coaches, pro hockey. Is there a difference in global sports versus like the local regional sports that we have here in the U.S.? Because we seem to always only care about ourselves here in the U.S. versus the global sports phenomena? Yeah, so sports as an entity, it's pretty young. It's only about 130 years old in the grand scheme of things. So as an industry, it's not that old of an industry. Here in the U.S., there are these silos of where 
you have a very passionate fan base, but it does not compare to what you have in Europe and other parts of the world. Sport is seen as a thing of national identity, similar to what you would have here in the U.S. with the NCAA, where people identify with schools either because they went there, their parents went there, or they grew up in the town where that school is, and they have a following of that school. And that would be the closest thing, the closest analogy to how I would describe sport in other parts of the world. And here, it is is something that if you are, say you're from a certain city and then you move to another city, over time, you might adopt that sports team as your favorite. In other parts of the world, it's not that way. Where, where you, First of all, the migration in other parts of the world is a lot slower. Here in the U.S., you can just pick up and move. In other parts of the world, it's not that way. But even if they do move, the sports teams... D- don't move. They stay with their original sport teams. It's a lot more passionate outside the U.S. if I can use that analogy. The closest thing that we would have to measuring this would be the passion that fans have for their college teams, whether it's college football in the South or college basketball in the Midwest and the North or what have you with that affiliation and where it doesn't change. So that's the major difference. Two things jump to mind. I just mentioned earlier that the one of our earlier guests, Matt DiBiase, wrote the book. The most current one is on the the number one coach in the, in college football, and that was the, the, the very words you just described. The difference between the U.S. as supporters of of sports and sports teams versus the national identity is. We actually use the college football coaches as the the Nick Sabans, the Lou Holtzes, et cetera, et cetera. If you went to Notre Dame, you went to Alabama, wherever you ended up, it didn't matter what city you lived in. You were always going to be a Bama fan. You were always going to be a Northwestern fan. When I moved to Chicago from the, the Detroit suburbs, I always used to joke because everybody would ask me, Howard, you know, who are you going to root for? And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Well, in Chicago, you know, you, you, as you probably know, we've got the North Side, which is Chicago Cubs, South Side, Chicago White Sox. And I'm like, well, neither of them. And they look at me like I'm crazy. And it's like, well, I'm from Detroit. And we may never know the sweetness of a Super Bowl, but we have some pretty decent teams. But I always used to joke, it's on our back of our birth certificate is a stamp that says you're from Detroit and that's all you root for. I mean, I just can't imagine rooting for any other team but a Detroit team. And we do see here in Chicago and probably other major cities, uh, we, we host a lot of these international soccer matches, especially over here at Soldier Field. And you can tell when Ecuador is in town and Brazil and Argentina and Mexico. And it's it's like... There's flags flying off of people's cars and everybody's wearing the home jersey. And that's nationalism at its finest is that's the home team. Yeah. And a sport like soccer takes it to a whole nother level because soccer is by far the most popular sport in the world. There's nothing that even comes close. There are more members in the soccer federation FIFA than there are at the United Nations in the United Nations. So think about this. The World Cup final in 2018 between Croatia and France drew a global audience of about 4.5 billion people. So the president of the soccer federation, which is called FIFA, the International Soccer Federation, if he wanted to address the universe at that point, he is talking to 4.5 billion people at the same time. There is no other person in the world, including the Secretary General of the United Nations, who can command a global audience of 4.5 billion people listening to this message at the same time. So that gives you the power of soccer, or as they call it, football, and a sport in general. So given that the the Secretary General of well, that's that's of the United Nations, the the what was the title for the, the director of FIFA? Oh, he's the FIFA president. FIFA president. So he can he can t- speak to an audience of 4.5 billion people. That makes me wonder, on a global scale, does sports like the World Cup, does that affect politics or is there an impact on politics, either across regional borders, you know, global borders? Yeah, it does. I mean, it's the... 
because the the typically in any country because sport is because soccer is so popular it is often used as a political tool in 1978 the world cup was hosted in argentina and the military junta in argentina in order to continue to maintain legitimacy they went all in with the FIFA World Cup. And there are those that wonder if there was something going on with Peru losing 6-1 in the semifinals. But it is something that people talk about. Governments, the way FIFA is set up, the national government of any country is not permitted to interfere in the, in the football affairs of the country. And largely that's been adhered to primarily because the president of that country has a direct interest in who the football federation or the soccer federation leader is. Because if they're not careful, it could lead to a genuine revolt and threat to the government because of how popular soccer is. So if the government were to say in some of these countries, you know what, we're not taking part in FIFA activities anymore, that poses a legitimate, proven threat to the government. So it's unlike the U.S. where, you know, it's take it or leave it. It's not that way in some of these other countries. So take a country like Panama, for instance. They qualify for the World Cup in 2018, and the, and the president declares a public holiday and a, stay, a day of praise and all these things just for Panama qualifying for the World Cup. Whereas, contrast a place like Italy, where the team did not qualify for the World Cup for the first time in ages. I mean, it damn near brought down the coalition government of the Italian prime minister by the, by the team not qualifying. So I remember years ago when there's a big competition in Europe called the Champions League, where the best of the best in all the leagues they play, and Manchester United was playing Bayern Munich, and Bayern Munich surrendered a two-goal lead, they surrendered a goal lead in extra time and ended up losing the final. The German parliament opened an investigation into what happened to lead to the total collapse of Bayern Munich in the 90th minute of the match. So a lot of these countries take soccer as a very, very serious thing. Now, incidentally, the United States, Canada, and Mexico will jointly be hosting the 2026 World Cup, which is, I guess, in six years. The United States will get most of those matches. Mexico and Canada will jointly host 10. The United States will host 40. But it's uh, it's important to FIFA that the sport of soccer also grow in the U.S. because the U.S. is seen as an emerging market for soccer. And what do you see as the challenges for having the world championships here within North America, Canada, U.S.? Mexico, do you see any challenges or is there going to be business as usual or is there a whole other level of accommodation, consensus, co collaboration? I believe that what will end up happening is that FIFA will work closely with U.S. officials to try to grow the sport. It's still been a big source of frustration, primarily because in the United States, unlike Britain, France, Germany, and some of these other countries, we do not have a ministry of sports. We don't have an umbrella organ. We have, we have what we call national governing bodies that are responsible for these different sports. So for soccer, it's USA Soccer. That is the organization that will work with FIFA. So they can't like go to a government body to affect policy and get people People to tear down buildings to build a new soccer pitch. They don't have that kind of leverage here in the U.S. And in fact, a city like Chicago, which has been great for soccer over the years, has pulled out of hosting the any matches during the 2026 World Cup, saying that the demands that FIFA made were just simply untenable for the city. So they pulled out. And I think that given the passion the Chicagoans have for soccer, that was just, a, and given the fact that USA Soccer is actually based in Chicago, that was just such a big irony. It's literally right down the street from where I live. Yeah, yeah. so Chicago won't be one of the host cities for any of the matches. But going beyond that, I'm hoping that the U.S. will be able to leverage this back. When the last time the U.S. hosted the World Cup was in 1994, the Major League Soccer, MLS, that league, came out of the U.S. hosting the World Cup. So I'm, hosting some, I'm hoping something similar comes out of that. And I'm hoping that the U.S. will be able to leverage 
the World Cup for the opportunity it is. Here's what I mean by that. A lot of times cities and municipalities set up sister relationships with countries and other municipalities that come to train. So FIFA is going to have training sites in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico for the 48 teams that will be a part of the tournament. So this represents a tremendous opportunity for businesses in those areas to strike bilateral relationships within the countries that come to train in their locale. That's just a for instance. So there's a lot from a commercial perspective that can come out of this if we know how to harness it properly. It didn't dawn on me at all that of that particular impact. I mean, all these teams coming here, they've got to, they're going to get here early, get acclimated, Get, get warmed up for those couple weeks, however long it takes. And, I mean, it's certainly an opportunity to grow the interest of soccer throughout the U.S. and and, and then again into the Canada and Mexico. I want to shift, if we could, to the Olympics. But before we do, let's talk about the women's soccer. I mean, they are phenomenal. I, I got a chance to see them play earlier this year at uh, a Soldier Field. I mean, just a phenomena, and that's it. That's all we hear. What 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 is what it see would seem to me that women's soccer it's doing probably better than the men's soccer here in the U.S. of advancing the cause of soccer and our participation in it as a world class sport. And it, it's almost as like you know, okay, now we're on to the football. We have our national champions coming up and Super Bowls coming up. And then there's nothing we, I mean, I think the, the captain of the team was one of the sports women's of the year, along with the young gymnast from the U.S., the gymnastics team. But we hear nothing about women's soccer. W- what's up with that? Yeah, so women's soccer globally does not get the same exposure that the men's team does. But it was hugely successful. The last World Cup that was held in 2019, that was won by the U.S., but In addition to that, just the participation of these other countries and the interest that it draws nationally, internationally, and the U.S. led by the U.S. women's soccer team. And the old adage is that the Women's World Cup doesn't start until the U.S. soccer team has played a match. And we've seen other teams challenge the U.S. for the title, if you will. So it's not just the U.S. winning. I mean, we've had Japan win, Brazil's won, and Germany's been a repeat winner. A couple of things have been driving this. Number one, because there's no real, and this is just ID's theory on this, there's no real collegiate football league as in American football for women. So you've got the best athletes in the NCAA, in the collegiate system, playing soccer. So that feeds the U.S. national team. The other thing is you've got the best athletes from other countries also playing soccer in the NCAA system. So you've got that feeder system that from a very young age, that children, young girls in the U.S. and other places are able to grow their skills because they're playing soccer. It's not like they're going to play soccer and then gravitate towards a collegiate football, NCAA football. The second thing is that from a viability perspective, the men's game globally, FIFA pays more. The payout for the French national team, which won the 2018 World Cup, was $40 million for the team. Contrast that with the women, the U.S. women's national team that won the World Cup last year made $4 million. So the gap is huge. And with respect to what the, what the payouts are for the teams that participate. In the U.S., there's no question that the women's team is doing better. And there is a lawsuit by members of the U.S. women's national team against USA Soccer. They're advocating for gender parity when it comes to payments and exposure and things like this. So I believe the case has gone to arbitration. But there is no question that in the United States, the women's game is on much more solid footing. It's doing much better than the men's game. And that's partially driven by the fact that the women are so much more competitive globally. And I'll just say this for soccer. In the U.S., the U.S. is a country that is used to being number one in anything that it does, except for soccer. When the U.S. competes, the U.S. men compete in soccer, it's not expected that they are going to win the World Cup. It's a miracle to even qualify, let alone win it. Now, 
what what we've seen happen, Howard, is that as it relates to participation in the U.S., Major League Soccer is the only professional sports league in the U.S. where the best players from around the world come to end their careers. Their careers come to die. And when they can no more play in Europe and South America, the premier, then they come to the Americans' Major League Soccer. Whereas in basketball, the best players in the world come to the NBA. In hockey, the best players in Scandinavia, Russia, Czechoslovakia, they all come to the NHL. And so the reverse is true for Major League Soccer. The best players in the world leave the U.S. to go to other parts of the world versus coming here. So that and that also has hurt the growth of the game because it's not expected that if you're talented that you're going to stay in the U.S. to play soccer. It sounds like there's room for improvement, and, and any improvement for that matter is going to take a long time because I, I don't I don't see it happening anytime soon. The Detroit Lions may win a Super Bowl before that happens, I think. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the the Olympics because you have been really fortunate to have. Number one, you you are the consummate historian. So you have a whole library of videos out on your YouTube channel. And I especially remember the Olympic moments where you're going through some very significant events that have occurred during the history of the Olymp- the modern Olympic history. And how did the, this really in-depth study of the Olympics and of the history? Because uh, yeah, you don't really see a lot of that documented and publicly available, at least here in the U.S., but how did you get into the, the historical aspect of the Olympics? And you know, I would love it also if you, you know, after we, we kind of transition from the, that conversation, talk a little bit about the work you're doing with the, the country Olympic committees in, in Africa. Yeah, so I'm a huge fan of athletics. So athletics carries the second the second week of the Olympics uh, is pure, almost purely athletics. When we're done with swimming and gymnastics in the first week before the Olympic program moves to the stadium for the second week, and it has just been one of these events because I travel so much around the world. It's just been a consistent factor that countries know of the Olympic brand. So for instance, here in the U.S., they may not know about the English Premier League and Chelsea and Manchester United, but they know about the Olympics. Conversely, in England and Germany, they may not know about the Dallas Cowboys and the Washington Redskins or Chicago Bears, but they know about the Olympics. So it has always been a constant, and it's just been an interest of mine to understand just the role that the Olympics have played in shaping the 20th and 21st century. For example, we moved the entire Cold War was fought on the platform of the Olympic Games. And it's just incredible the different machinations and recruitment of spies at the starting blocks of one of these Olympic Games where you had, you literally had a mole talking to the guy next to him in the starting block, recruiting him to be a KGB agent. It was just one of those things that I was just extremely interested in. And then, so over time, I just kept reading more and more about it, went back to graduate school at Northwestern and wrote a master's thesis on the Olympic Games and the developmental impact it has on emerging markets. And so it's just been an area of intense interest and focus. Let me give you an example. So you look at certain trends, for instance, gymnastics and swimming. And the more I looked at the countries that participated in these events, it occurred to me that if your economy is not at a certain size, you cannot put an athlete in gymnastics or in the pool. And it's just fascinating that there is a direct relationship between the size of a nation's economy and the number and the type of sports that it competes in. So it's not until the Olympics moves to the second week of the Olympic program at the stadium that you see everybody getting involved. But that first week, you've got to have a country that's got a big economy to participate. So it's just one of the things that has just been fascinating, and I decided to do a deep dive into it. 
Fantastic. And before we kind of leave this thread, looking back at, at a lot of these historical events, I mean, you've got quite a few. And, and for the folks that are listening, we're going to provide you a link back to ID's YouTube channel so you can listen to them. I mean, they're they're fascinating. They're 6, 10, 12 minutes long. And you could literally sit down in an afternoon and just binge watch. And they're, they're fantastic. ID, is there one particular event looking back and what you have studied in the modern Olympics, that was a, what, what's that term? A loggerhead moment, something that was like, this changed the game forever. Is there any moment like that? Yeah. You know, for me, I remember I watched the miracle on ice, the United States beating the Soviet union and said, Especially Russia in the at the 1980 Winter Olympics in Lake Placid to qualify for the gold medal game. What a lot of people don't know about that match is that 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 game with the Russians. Had the U.S. lost that match, they would be completely out of medal contention. It's not like they would have won the silver; they would have been knocked out completely in the tournament. As it was, they still had to beat Finland in the gold medal game to win the gold medal. And it's not like Russia. So, so, so Finland, even though Finland lost the gold medal match, they ended up not meddling. Russia took silver and Sweden took the bronze. Now, what's fascinating about that whole thing is that shortly after that happened, the United States announced, because this was in February of 1980, a couple months later, the United States, States Olympic Committee announced that it would boycott the 1980 Summer Games in Moscow. And that boycott almost brought down the Olympic movement, as it were, because the Olympics are so dependent on the technology and the participation of the United States that everything it does now is geared towards making sure that the United States participates in the Olympic Games. So there's that era, that 1980 boycott was a very big deal. And again, even though technically the Carter administration really didn't have the power to keep to prevent athletes from going because the United States Olympic Committee is an independent agency. But Vice President Walter Mondale leaned heavily on the USOC and they ended up boycotting. Now, technically, the, the only thing, what Carter could have done, his State Department could have blocked the issuance of passports for travel. To, so that was his real leverage. But that moment really, for me, really just cast, it just put things into perspective as to, here it is, the, the most powerful nation on earth, and that was the weapon that we decided to deploy. So that told me that, for me, at least, that the U.S. plays a very major role in the games. In fact, in 1978, the Olympics were, they almost went bankrupt. They were down to their last $200,000, and there was a discussion of the United Nations, specifically UNESCO, taking over the Olympic movement. So just the way it was... It was the the LA Los Angeles stepped up to agree to host the 1984 games, and that also provided cash infusion, much needed cash infusion to save the games. So I would say those two things: the 1980 boycott and LA stepping in with the new sponsorship marketing model to save the financial future, to guarantee the financial future of the games. Those two events, for me, really set the tone for what we the modern Olympics, the post. 1970s Olympics, if you will. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the work you're doing now in in Africa, which, by the way, I am incredibly envious, not only because it's on my proverbial bucket list, but it's also not just for the safaris, I might add, but for coffee, because I'm a huge coffee fan. And in the full disclosure, folks, you know, I and I to have some history, we do know each other. A bag of Rwandan coffee did fall into his suitcase and <laughs> ended up in outside my door one day. I don't know how that happened, but <laughs> Heidi, talk about if you would the work that you're doing with the sports organizations in in, a, in the African countries and on the continent. Yeah, so in a lot of emerging economies in Africa and the Caribbean, Howard, sports is not seen as a five hundred billion dollar industry. It is. 
it is seen more as fun and games. So I am working in partnership with the Olymp- International Olympic Committee to help develop marketing strategies for these Olympic committees in these emerging markets to assist them with achieving an operational level of financial independence which they do not necessarily have today. So we're helping them develop marketing strategies, marketing plans, um, understanding the concept of private sector partnerships to drive and fund sport programs. Because as it is, these countries are heavily dependent on government funding. So when the economy takes a downturn or when there's a change of government, it impacts sport programs. So if they are able to design and develop the right type of marketing plans and create the right type of partnerships like they have done in the United States and in the UK and other parts of Europe, then that would go a long way to developing sport to those countries. So I'm currently working with a variety of countries in the Caribbean and in Africa to develop marketing strategies for them to grow the sport platforms. And what has been your biggest aha moment or insight that has come out of working with these organizations and these countries? Because I would imagine the the officials of these national organizations, the, the Olympic bodies, I would imagine they're very passionate and feel very strongly that this is the best. We're doing things. We're fantastic. And so I'm curious, from your perspective, what, what's been the biggest aha moment for you coming out of the work that you're doing with them? Just the rate in which they absorb knowledge. I mean, they are just like sponges. They're eager and they've been very attentive, very receptive to this new information. They want you to stay longer. They want, they just want more and more and more information. And you can literally see not just a light bulb going off, but fireworks literally lighting up the room as you're talking about these concepts because they embrace them. And then they now want you to help them apply it to the local context. All right, so we, we know how it's done in the U.S. and in Europe. How can it work here? So just the eagerness of embracing the knowledge that we've had to share has been phenomenal. And I ran into someone who she had a uh, – she was – she it's, my programs are usually three- and four-day programs, Howard. She was pulled out of the program the second day, and she told her boss, who pulled her out of the program – that she would rather quit rather than miss day two of our marketing seminar. So I think for us, it's really been just how people have embraced the information we have to share and how for them, the thirst for additional knowledge that perhaps wasn't there previously, how we've been able to make a difference in that regard. If you could look at the crystal ball five five years from now, or actually, you know, okay, so two years, let's say four years from now, eight years from now, the next decade, Okay. What do you see the biggest change coming from these Caribbean nations, Africa, that that doesn't exist today for the for those countries? I think that what we're going to see is uh, we're going to see them embrace the private sector a lot more closely, because what's happening is there are more and more demands from the public for sport infrastructure, for stadiums, for skate parks. So we're going to see the proliferation perhaps of extreme sports, which you don't really see there, skateboarding and surfing and things like this. So I can see over the next decade, these sports starting to gain traction. And as corporate brands look to expand the footprint into those markets, the brands that sponsor these extreme sports are constantly looking to expand their footprint. And I can see Africa as being a location where they do that. So I can see a situation where partners are going to are going to look more and more towards that market to expand their footprint, specifically in the areas of technology. We've seen companies like Yahoo, Google, Amazon, Apple. These are all major players now in the sport market. They're bidding for major properties, Wimbledon, the NFL, and things like this. Twitter's involved. So Those companies, and especially Chinese brands that are looking to expand their footprints, are going to look to the African continent to do that because of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world, three are in Africa. 
And so we have a burgeoning middle class that would be great for the consumption of these products. And so that's going to inversely have a relationship on the sponsorship of sports in those economies. Idy, I have no doubt whatsoever that you are going to be one busy man over the next, uh, <laughs> let's just say decade, because that's no, no doubt about that. And look, I put it out there. <laughs> if you need a podcaster to join you on these trips, just let me know. Just let me know. I'm there. Um, I'll bring back my own coffee beans. <laughs> so, Heidi, if our listeners would like to learn more about you uh, and your work, where's the best places for them to go? Yeah, you can go to my website. It's www.idsports.com. ID is I D Y S P O R T S, idsports.com. Or you can go to the ID Sports YouTube channel where we have the Olympic Moment Series where, as Howard mentioned earlier, we record short video vignettes of about three to four minutes long where we talk about different things, different elements and events that help shape the Olympic movement into what it is today. From the origins of the Olympic torch relay to Nadia Comaneci's Perfect 10 to why the U.S. does not dip its flag at opening ceremonies. So we talk about quite a few things on our YouTube channel. From an engagement perspective, if you'd like for me to work with you from a commercial perspective, consulting, you can find out information about us and our consulting businesses and services we offer in the areas of marketing, content development, media, at www.idsports.com. And we're looking forward to the Tokyo Games. The Tokyo Games come up in 2020 this year. So it's going to be the second time that Japan has hosted the Summer Olympics. The last time they hosted the Olympics was the Winter Games in 1998. So this will be a fascinating Olympics. And we're expecting to see all kinds of gadgets. And they've already announced that Toyota has announced that robots will be doing the ticketing and things like this, so no more. So I guess scanning your ticket in, your ticket as you enter is so 2019, right? I mean, you know, so now robots got to do it. And driverless cars with no driver, all these things are supposed to be tested and they're supposedly working. We're going to see those at the Olympic Games. So looking forward to being an analyst at these Olympic Games. So if you need someone, a specialist to talk Olympics, assist you with the Olympics, or just assist you with marketing and branding, let me know. I am available. All right. Well, uh, that's one of the goals of the podcast is you only have brilliant guests out here. And ID just, you know, <laughs> the work that you do, I just, to me, it's amazing. I mean, I love my coaching work. I, I, I love the, the engagement with our clients and individuals, but and there's a, there's just a little bit of envy. I think that would be the word when I when I see you <laughs> in Africa and doing your tours and, and helping your 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 wonderful clients there. ID, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us on the Success Insight podcast. Uh, you're welcome, Howard. Thank you for helping me, and also thank you for your coaching, Howard. I mean, I remember several years ago when. I, I walked into one of your seminars dazed and confused and not quite sure what I wanted to do. And, you know, and you kept pushing saying, look, you've got this niche, stay in your lane, follow your passion, keep going. And your encouragement has been tremendous and it led us to where we are today. I cannot thank you enough for that push that we needed at that critical point where we were. So thank you so much for the, the work that we've done with the Fox Coaching. My, my pleasure, ID. And, you know, I think this, the seeing how you've grown, you've declared this major, you've, st you, you've, picked, <laughs> you've picked a lane and now, you know, it, it doesn't happen overnight, but it's, it's happening step by step. So it's, it's wonderful. And we definitely look forward to seeing what comes out of this year for you, especially your participation in the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. There you have it, folks. We have just been chatting with Idi Uyo, Olympic scholar and sports marketing specialist. If you need information, if you're in the market, you know, if you have an interest in how do I participate in this global sports economy, the technology, the merchandise, however you do it, ID is the man you want to talk to, whether it's tourism, event marketing, planning, policy development, education, training, 
broadcasting, content development. Definitely check out ID and his work and do visit idsports.com as well as his YouTube channel. We'll provide the links back to them on our show notes and we'll also provide a link back to ID's LinkedIn profile. So great start to the new year, 2020, and hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Do remember, please comment uh, on our podcast, whatever venue you are listening to the podcast, whether it's our, our website, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of the podcast sites, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, we're everywhere. Just look up Success Inside Podcast and let us know what you think. And if you need an introduction to ID, we're more than happy to provide that as well. And Or if you're interested, if you're a fellow podcaster and you want to uh, have ID on your show, we'll help you make that. We'll make that introduction for you as well. So folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day, and we'll see you on the next episode of the Success Insight Podcast. Take care now. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com.